cartoon showed a creature in his life deep in conversation. The wife says, today let's do something different. Why don't you be charming at home and grouchy at church? Ouch. Well, that really doesn't apply to me because I'm often grouchy in both places. Amen. It reminds me of the wife who said, sometimes I wake up grumpy. And other times, I let him sleep. <laughs> the real question is, am I what I appear to be? It's not just preachers that sometimes put on a good facade when they're out in public. Other people also have this characteristic, this lifestyle of being one thing when others are looking and being something entirely different in a different setting. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, we have the sixth beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. We look at the first part of this beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart. It has been said that in Matthew 5, 8, we find the essence of Christianity. For Christianity is first and foremost a religion of the heart. Jack Lewis says this beatitude places stress upon inward purity as contrasted with concern for external appearances and for ritual cleanliness. Jesus was saying that we must be pure in the center of our being. We have a very clear biblical example of what it was not to be pure in heart. In John's Gospel, chapter 18, Jesus has been arrested. He has, of course, appeared before the Jewish leaders. They've said he deserves to die. And so he's going to be taken to Pilate. And John tells us this. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning. And to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. The Jews were concerned about ceremonial cleanness, while at the same time, they cried out for the blood of an innocent prisoner. Interesting, isn't it? They were not pure in heart. Maybe look good on the outside, but not the current heart. Max Licato refers to the heart as the totality of the inner person, the seat of character, a freeway cloverleaf where all emotions and prejudices and wisdom converge. It is a switch house that receives freight cars loaded with moods, emotions, and convictions and puts them on the right track. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. R.B.G. Tasker defines pure in heart as the single-minded who are free from the tyranny of the divided self. J.B. Phillips translates pure in heart as the utterly sincere, blessed are the utterly sincere. And so to be pure in heart is to be basically what you appear to be. John Stott, in commenting on this beatitude, says those who are pure in heart says their whole life public and private, is transparent before God and men. Their very heart, including their thoughts and motives, is pure, unmixed with anything devious, ulterior base. Hypocrisy and deceit are abhorrent to them. They are without God. John Piper writes, Jesus did not come into the world simply because we had some bad habits that needed to be broken. He came into the world because we have dirty hearts that need to be purified. In his book called Rumors of Another World, Philip Yancey concludes one of his chapters with a quote from Malcolm Muggeridge to show the subtleness of sin. It is precisely when you consider the best in man that you see there is in each of us a hard core of pride or self-centeredness which corrupts our best achievements and blights our best experiences. It comes out in all sorts of ways, 
in the jealousy which spoils our friendships, in the vanity we feel when we have done something pretty good, in the easy conversion of love into lust, in the meanness which makes us depreciate the efforts of other people, in the distortion of our own judgment by our own self-interest, in our fondness for flattery and our resentment of blame, and in our self-assertive profession of fine ideals which we never begin to practice. Now that last line really rings true, doesn't it? As Christians, sometimes we do a pretty good job of mask management. But if the truth were known, we often make self-assertive professions of fine ideals which we never begin to practice. William Barclay wrote, To examine one's own motives is a daunting and a shaming thing. For there are few things in this world that even the best of us can do with completely unmixed motives. A couple from Bakersville, California had just purchased a new boat, but were having some serious problems. No matter how hard they tried, they couldn't get their 22-foot boat going. It was very sluggish no matter which way they turned, no matter how much power was applied. After an hour of trying to make it go, they pulled into a nearby marina hoping someone there could tell them what was wrong. Well, a third check of the top side of the boat revealed everything was in perfect working condition. The engine ran fine, the outdrive went up and down, and the propeller was the correct size and pitch. Then one of the marina guys jumped in the water to check underneath. He came up choking on the water because he was laughing so hard. As far as I know, this is a true story, under the boat, still strapped securely in place, was the trailer. Things weren't what they appeared to be with these folks in their boat. When God looks underneath our life, what does he see? God can see us as we truly are. The Lord can see our hearts, and when our hearts are pure, we can see him. Augustine put it this way. Before God can deliver us from ourselves, we must undeceive ourselves. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. What does it mean to see God? Well, I think it is talking of both now and later. Certainly, later, that is, when Jesus comes again, when the saved are called into heaven, we shall see God. John writes in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we shall be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And we can also, in a sense, see God now. A little girl once asked her grandma, Why do you close your eyes when you sing? She replied with a smile, so I can see God. When we have God's purity in our hearts, we will see Him everywhere. We see God all around us. C.S. Lewis wrote, It is safe to tell the pure in heart that they shall see God, for only the pure in heart want to. On one occasion, Lord Alfred Tennyson was asked, what is your greatest desire? He answered, a clearer vision of God. Perhaps it was this single desire that prompted his final instructions to his son. He asked his son, as the executor of his estate, to place his poem, Crossing the Bar, at the end of his collection of poems when they were published. And a part of it goes like this. For though from out are born a time and place, the flood may bear me far. I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. Tennyson seemed to me that his final wish was to see God. He captured the truth of Christ's beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God.